Okay. Um, okay, welcome everybody. Um, we'd like to uh, welcome you on behalf of the sociology department to the uh, this third uh, seminar in the seminar series, Critical Perspectives on Youth, Community and Urban Regeneration. Um, today we're delighted to welcome Matt Bowden, um, who's a lecturer in social care in the Dublin Institute of Technology. He's also a research associate at the School of Social Work and Social Policy in uh, Trinity College, Dublin. His research interests include, um, and this will be of interest to a lot of you, I know a lot of you are studying in these areas, uh, public policy uh, on youth crime, urban governance, uh, social order and social cohesion. Uh, among his publications um, is uh, his work on the impact of uh, the Garda Special Project. Today, Matt will present uh, on urban governance and practice strategies in youth crime prevention. Um, his uh, presentation promises to be very informative. One, one aim of his presentation today is to demonstrate uh, that the, the emergence of youth crime prevention is connected with questions of urban governance and the governance of the subject. Um, he also pays attention to the Irish case, uh, and he'll argue that there's a type of what he calls a moral curriculum. Uh, it'll be interesting to find out what he means by this, uh, that has typically dominated uh, the field, and uh, he suggests that alternatives are generally subordinated uh, or excluded, and it be very interesting to find out what those alternative viewpoints are. Um, the format is fairly straightforward. Dr. Uh, Bowden will speak for approximately 40 minutes, um, and there should be time then for questions afterwards, approximately 25 minutes of uh, questions after that. So I think there's enough of us here uh, to give a nice, warm, limerick welcome to Dr. Matt Bowden. I think it was Liam Ryan who said that uh, if you clap before the person has spoken, that it's a great act of hope. Yeah. And if you clap after the person has spoken, it's a great act of charity. Uh, anyway, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for the welcome. I rece I've received welcomes of various kinds as I've come to Limerick uh, this morning from the taxi driver on the train. Uh, or when I got off the train to, to now. Thank you very much for that. Um, uh, let me uh, start off by clicking on my uh, title here. It sounds, it sounds kind of grandiose, but uh, I think uh, uh, urban governance uh, and practice strategies in youth crime prevention. I'm not going to present this as an academic paper. Rather, this is a this is a this is a few ideas. Yeah, it's a few ideas, but it's a few ideas that I think you will hopefully be able to read a little bit more about uh, when it's published as a paper in the journal Theoretical <coughs> Theoretical Criminology. Uh, hopefully, hopefully due out this year. Uh, a lot of my, most of my work is working with um, social care workers as a, as a sociology teacher, um, and but also with, with criminology students in our MA in criminology or Masters of Arts in criminology at BIT. I have to get the plug in somehow. Yeah. Okay. Um, um, and uh, one of the one of some of the ideas that are in here are part of a module I teach on crime prevention and society, which looks at the role of. Uh, uh, communities of our communities are mobilised into crime prevention and examines the kind of international literature on uh, issues to do with crime control, community safety, uh, uh, and governance. And I suppose the key kind of issue here is about governance. There's a huge uh, literature on, on this area, which has to do with how people are regulated, yeah? whether that's regulated by institutions or regulated by the state. And the discourse in which uh, youth crime prevention has has really uh, uh, proliferated, certainly in the in the British literature, has been around this question of governance. Yeah? So I hope to explore a little bit about what governance is about. Uh, <coughs> I want to also kind of introduce some ideas from uh, a particular theorist that I work with, who's Pierre, Pierre Bourdieu. You probably would be familiar with Bourdieu. Some of you, uh, Bourdieu is not traditionally seen as a uh, a theorist that works in the governance area, but uh, some of my work is uh, uh, is using his ideas and his framework uh, to articulate an alternative uh, theory of governance. We won't need to get too deep into that, but what I'll mention in passing.
Okay. Uh, now, uh, there has been, as I said, a fairly substantial literature has grown uh, in the English language, mostly in the UK, but also also in uh, in, in in the US and in France to some extent. Around looking at uh, uh, crime prevention strategies as a form of of governance, yeah? as a way of developing rationalities and technologies for the government of the soul. This is a Foucault. This comes from Foucault's ideas about uh, the governmentalization of the state and the ins- the inscription upon the soul or in the soul of each individual uh, where power lies. In society. Uh, now, when, when Foucault talks about soul, he's not talking very in a religious sense. But you know, when the French tend to talk about soul. They tend to talk about. Uh, they tend to be talking about the human spirit, the, the spirit of humanity. Yeah. Um, uh, youth crime prevention strategies have also been referred to as being part of this uh, responsabilization strategy. Uh, and uh, David Garland, who's written uh, extensively on uh, the culture of control. Uh, talks about uh, 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 this called responsabilization, that the citizen is asked to be uh, more of a consumer of, of services to protect themselves, uh, to be much more prudential, and to be less expectant upon the state to provide them with security and safety. Uh, from that point of view, there's, a, there's an onus on each individual citizen, on each subject, to uh, take on board this new culture, yeah? Uh, as part of this cultural turn uh, towards responsabilization of, 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 the, of the individual. And then another way of thinking about youth crime prevention strategies that has emerged, I suppose, associated mostly with uh, Nicholas Rose. I hope you don't mind if I drink while I speak. Uh, talks about youth crime prevention as being a form of panoptic regulation, a form of all-seeing uh, uh, monitoring uh, uh, and s- cleansing, uh, kind of moral cleansing, where people are asked to uh, take on board the right or- orientations, the right values, the right uh, the right uh, uh, dispositions, as it were, uh, in order to regulate themselves. Yeah. Now, this is, I suppose, a kind of uh, an antidote to the. The, 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 the predominant paradigm in youth crime and prevention uh, uh, that has emerged in the last three decades, maybe, uh, variously referred to as risk factorology or uh, as the risk factor paradigm, uh, largely coming out of psychology, um, <coughs> but, uh, also in some some parts of, of, of some fields within within, within criminology and so, and sociology. Uh, based on the on the you know the likelihood of a person uh, 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 com- becoming an offender or becoming delinquent, uh, based upon uh, what we know from predictive factors, yeah, largely based on work that was done for, uh, in a longitudinal study done by uh, done in the East End of London uh, on adolescent boys over a long period. Uh, and looking at whether or not they, they developed uh, normally or whether they developed uh, delinquent tendencies. Actually, very interesting about the point here about the hierarchy of knowledge. It's referred to as the Cambridge study, <laughs> but it took place in the East End of London. So it's, it says something about where the researchers are coming from and the hierarchy of knowledge that's around these, around these uh, uh, kinds of ideas. And that inspired uh, the, one of the main instigators of this, David Farrington, to come up with the idea of prevention experiments that we need to. We need to get into this idea of having evidence-based value for money uh, uh, prevention experiments that are based on uh, having detailed, prospective, and longitudinal evaluations that show that uh, certain types of interventions are more effective than others. However, what predominates here is the idea of the, 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 the locus of change is in the subject. That the subject's behaviour is the focus of, of focus of change. Yeah, uh, that the person has to deal with their offending behaviour yeah? uh, uh, and that, that the locus of change uh, is, is within the individual. Now, as some criminological researchers have said, well, yeah, 
that sounds all very well, but um, it doesn't really tell us very much about the context, yeah? and it doesn't try to change the context. And it tells us nothing about how context structures the individuals. Uh, you can change individuals as much as you want, but you know, put them back out on the street, and you know, they're living in the same context again. And uh, that structures their behaviour. Uh, it takes it takes behaviour out of context, as it were. Uh, an argument made by uh, uh, Ray Pawson and Nick Tilly is that you know, these kind of prevention experiments based on outcome studies they tend not to be they tend not to transfer very well because they don't, they don't localise themselves very well in a new context. And uh, I suppose a position that I think I associate myself with, uh, there's an emerging body of research that says that, well, you know, you can be as Foucauldian as you like and think of uh, crime prevention as being this extension of the panoptic carceral society out into the social body and blah, 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 blah. Um, but let's be realistic here. Yeah? Let's be a little bit more realistic here. Crime is a very serious social problem. Uh, crime disrupts communities. Crime uh, splits up families. Um, we do really need to take it on board as a very, very serious issue for policy and for, practi for practice. Uh, and even with... Uh, uh, dominant discourses like the risk factor paradigm and the evidence-based paradigm and the value for money, money frameworks and all these kinds of things that have permeated public policy in the US, the UK and to some, ex some extent here. Um, uh, we, do need to, we do need to be aware of what practitioners do. Yeah? Because what practitioners do sometimes makes a difference. It makes a difference to what actually gets implemented because practitioners have some agency, they have some power, they have the capacity to def decide whether things actually get implemented and they have some, some power to shape how they get implemented. So we can't assume, as some Foucauldian uh, uh, criminolo criminological theories assume, that people are, are dopes and that they, you know, that they can't strategize, that they can't practice in ways that, um, that makes implementation uh, take on a different form. An example of this would be uh, I suppose the ads book, the antisocial behaviour order <clears throat> in the UK, uh, statistics on uh, at the ads in the UK uh, in terms of the numbers of ads books issued is skewed towards one particular part of the country uh, and that's Manchester, mostly the Manchester area uh, because Manchester uh, City Council were particularly virulent in uh, introducing the, the ads book. Um, and one of the reasons it is argued uh, by uh, authors such as Gordon Hughes and, uh, and others who've written about this is that uh, practitioners have, based on their local traditions, have determined that we're not going to localise these here. We're not going to implement them here. Uh, so what practitioners do uh, makes a difference to what actually gets uh, implemented. However... <coughs> I have to say that there is, I'm not really here, and I hope people aren't disappointed if they're looking for a technical fix. Yeah? I had my technical fix this morning as I left uh, uh, in the form of a cup of coffee. Um, but uh, I'm not here to talk about strat to talk about practice as a you know as a technology that can fix ills. Yeah? Uh, I'm sorry if that disappoints you. Um, but nonetheless, there are, there are things I think that people can do that to, 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 to make a difference, and the things that practitioners can do to make a difference. Uh, when I agreed to call, I kind of clarified with Martin that, and I said, well, do you want, do you want me to do an academic paper? And I suggested maybe I'll just talk about your current work and areas of interest that you, that you are. So what I'm going to present now are just a couple of ideas, uh, I think, uh, and I'd be interested to hear what you what you have to say. My current research interest, as I suggested at the outset, was to uh, look at developing a, 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 board, a Bourdieuian approach to governance, largely based on the kind of theoretical frameworks from uh, Pierre Bourdieu. Uh, because crime prevention is really about governance. Yeah, it's about individual regulation. It's about uh, regulations in terms of how how the both how the 
perpetrators should kind of think about, you know, well, you know, I can't, I can't really kind of do this at the time. I have to be rational in how I approach this. Uh, and for the victim, well, I have to be able to protect myself uh, against victimhood. Um, so in a sense, it's about how we govern without the state. We have to think about how we're going to rely on uh, using technologies and using uh, uh, like burial arms and better locks and all these kinds of things to protect ourselves uh, without the state. So that's, that's what governance is about. Right? It's to do with uh, individual, individual regulation. But it's also to do with it's also to do with partnerships and networks, yeah, and the way in which the state has become decentered and less bureau less bureaucratized and more arguably more uh, more uh, decentered into networks. Um, <coughs> so, needless to say, I have been reading books. case that I'm most familiar with, uh, and some of you will know about as well. Uh, uh, <clears throat> what is governance? Governance is about, I suppose, three things, if you take a more viewing approach to governance. It's about uh, integration, inculcation, and domination. Incul integration in the sense of drawing drawing together a political unity in the state and the citizen, uh, inculcation in, in, in relation to uh, how people are uh, trained, uh, how the sub subject is formed, the, the, the citizen's uh, subjectivity is formed, uh, and ultimately, would you suggest, of course, that that leads to uh, a form of domination? Uh, now, Bourdieu's thinking really relates to uh, it relates to things like territory. And he said this theory of the state is that he suggests that, well, ter you know, the state first has to secure the territory and provide security to citizens within the territory. But then it has to uh, it has to permeate the territory with a meaning system, a common meaning system, and going along with. Uh, uh, political unity through the territory, uh, uh, you have to have this uh, idea of a kind of linguistic unity. The people sharing the same system of meanings and understandings with one another. And then the state then has the power to nominate, to select and designate officials to the tasks of governing. What he calls the uh, noblesse des cat, the you know the local notables, the people who will deliver uh, the curriculum at local level. Uh, I'm going to get to curriculum, as you suggested, as you as you uh, introduced earlier. So that uh, notables are people like clerics, uh, artists, teachers. Uh, uh, Public health officials, all these kinds of people, they're kind of part of the uh, uh, the noblesse d'état, and the state retains the point, retains the power to nominate these people to to, uh, to official positions. In that way, uh, uh, a territory can be integrated. Yeah, territory can be integrated, and the state can, as it were, penetrate civil society. Uh, uh, penetrate civil society through this kind of domination, integration, uh, uh, implication. Okay, that all sounds, all sounds very interesting and all that. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, you've established that you know a little bit about Pierre Bourdieu, that's great. Uh, but is there, is there a case for this? Well, let's look at the, let's look at the emergence of youth crime uh, uh, and disorder prevention, as I like to call it, uh, in the Irish context. 
it didn't come out of nowhere, and nothing ever comes out of nowhere. Something just doesn't arrive from the planet Zanussi as it used to, like a fridge. Uh, it gets there because people put it there, and they put it there for a reason. Uh, it's put there in a particular historical context. Um, let's have a think about this historical context. Uh, speaking of which, uh, uh, there, are very, there are big similarities uh, in, in, in terms of how the uh, public housing estates on the periphery of Dublin were, put, were, 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 were built and constructed and for the same reasons as uh, Neve documents uh, documented in her book. So there are very, very strong parallels between uh, uh, some of the regeneration areas here in, uh, in Nimerick and some of the areas I'm going to talk about. Uh, and it is about kind of understanding and recognising that it is about, as the, the subtitle of the book is, it is about social exclusion and, and change. And so what I want to talk about here, I suppose, reflects those two themes about uh, social exclusion and change. So let me say something about uh, territory and where these youth diversion projects came from, or we could call, you know, give them a more abstract title, youth crime and disorder prevention. Where does it come from? Why did it come here? Uh, where did we get it from? Why did we need it? Uh, what were the historic conditions in which it was introduced? Uh, why is that important? Um, uh, uh, and so on. Uh, not a very good picture, actually. Sorry about that. It's the only one I have. And I, you can see I've actually squiggled on it to make it come out better in the photocopy. But it's really uh, defaced it here. This is from the Miles Wright report. Miles Wright was a, a town planner and architect who uh, was commissioned by... Uh, the Fianna Fáil government in the mid-60s uh, to uh, come up with a proposal for the Greater Dublin area uh, that would uh, be a plan for modernising Dublin. Yeah. Uh, the squiggly bits in here on, on, the, on the top of it are as a development zone in which the building could not take place because that's where the airport is. Uh, uh, they were restricted in terms of how they could deal with the um, how they could deal with the terrible conditions in the inner city at the time, poverty, inequality, poor housing, poor sanitation, uh, and Wright proposed that the only the only option for developing new housing was to use the land available westwards on the outskirts of Dublin. Yeah. Uh, and the three dots, well, there were originally four dots proposed. The three dots represent uh, Blanchardstown, which is now a huge uh, multicultural centre in this country. Uh, Blanchardstown, uh, Clumdalkin, and uh, Tala. Uh, effectively, three new towns built on the kind of Milton Keynes model is what was proposed. Yeah? Uh, this was a, a, a vision of modern Ireland that came along with the, Mala with the Lamas years. Yeah? Uh, Kind of a bit faint here. This is like a photocopy of an oldish kind of document that has yellowed. Um, but you can kind of make out the kind of art artist's impression. This is from 1967. Um, so it very much had this kind of modern kind of urban landscape as what was being proposed. Yeah. Uh, this is an image of Tal. Uh, some high-rise buildings have emerged. The motorway flyover did come around about 1992 or thereabouts, but this was all goes back to the Miles Wright Report in 1967. Um, and many, many, many of Wright's recommendations were implemented. Uh, the development of the three towns uh, actually went ahead, but uh, uh, contraction in the economy stunted the extent to which the infrastructure could be, could be developed around it. So a lot of the housing went ahead, but uh, much of the kind of uh, Amenities and leisure and uh, artistic and cultural uh, facilities didn't follow until some 30 years later. Um, now, you see a picture here, I suppose, of uh, a fully ordered, kind of integrated society. That's what was envisaged. That was the kind of optimism that was, that was uh, around, I suppose, at the time. And uh, this was going to be uh, our version of. Milton, Milton Keynes, the new towns that had sprung up in Britain and indeed in France uh, was very much the model for uh, uh, what was proposed. Of course, the reality, the reality was different. Yeah. 
the reality was different. Um, we no longer have the Sunday Tribune. Oh dear. Uh, and this is a picture taken from Neilstown. <laughs> Neilstown is uh, Neilstown and Rowlandstown are basically the same place, except Rowlandstown is built on Neilstown Road, so the, the two terms are used. Uh, 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 a series of events took place over, I suppose, about a six-month period, culminating uh, with a, a riot uh, in which uh, policemen were injured. A lot of uh, damage was done. Um, uh, fire brigade people came to put out the fire when the, when the car was set alight and the firemen were attacked and the firemen were, were sent to hospital. Uh, like in any working class community, there's a kind of outrage at, at themselves for letting this happen. They go and they raise money for the, for the firemen and they you know, have a raffle and have a charity gig and all this kind of stuff. Um, and uh, 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 there is there is some reaction, but the build up to this, the build up to this point, sees state officials from the Department of Justice uh, going on regular tours of this particular neighbourhood to fact find as to what's going on. Yeah, and they even before this happens, they foresee this coming about. Yeah, they foresee this event taking place, and when it does, they're ready. To, to respond. It's just another newspaper, uh, a newspaper um, cutting from the time. I've redacted this slightly, okay? Um, uh, a very uh, well meaning civil servant sent me this memo from, uh, to, that was sent to the minister the Monday following those riots, and those two pictures from the newspapers were, were clipped to the back of this memo. Yeah. And uh, uh, he says that the minister should see these very disturbing reports at the earliest opportunity. There are real grounds for concern that some of the appalling scenes of urban disorder witnessed recently in England, or something close to it, would be repeated in Romanstown, or one of its sister troubled areas, Kilnard and Ta, and My Ross and Limerick. But what's most interesting here is the, is the handwritten note. Uh, these reports reveal a very serious situation in Romanstown and are in effect a cry for help from the Gardaí there, similar to one received and acted upon a few years ago uh, from the Gardaí in Tala. Uh, that was after the murder had taken place. Uh, and I think we should have a meeting suggested by Mr Dalton, who was then the Secretary of the Department of Justice, um, as soon as possible. Uh, the meeting took place the next day. This was like less than a week. That evening, uh, sorry, the evening after the meeting, this was a Monday, the Tuesday, uh, the meeting took place. All these senior guards from around the country came to this meeting in, in guard headquarters, including Department of Justice officials. Um, uh, and the minister addressed it all that night. So there was like that. It was very quick, I think. They were ready for this. It was something that wasn't something that they pondered over for a long period of time. Uh, it was something that uh, was, was going to happen, and when it did, they were able to, able to act on it. The next day, or the next evening, the minister was in the doll setting up uh, what became the Interdepartmental Group on Urban Crime and Disorder. Yeah. So, I think the point I'm trying to make here is there's something about how the state from has to integrate territory. Yeah, the feet, there was a, a very, very strong sense of insecurity around us. That we cannot let these areas drift away without some kind of sovereign integration. Yeah? Uh, we have to be able to show our citizens that we are in control. So there is something here, I think, about how these territories are governed. Uh, at this time, let's not forget, the, 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 the civic infrastructure is extremely poor. There is no local authority, for instance. The local authorities don't really appear in any shape or don't embed themselves in people's lives until maybe about kind of like five, six, seven years later. Uh, this, this, the, the local authorities on the, on the periphery were part of the county, which was a huge area for the population it had. Uh, and 
many of the residents living there, many of the tenants, the local authority tenants, were uh, were landlords of the city council. So their landlord was situated nine, ten miles away in some cases. Yeah, uh, and there was very much a kind of crisis of territoriality going on. All our criminologists have referred to this as a crisis of legitimacy, and that the state takes a disciplinary turn when it loses its legitimacy and tries to kind of, uh, through consent, tries to win people back. Uh, I'd say what's actually going on here is a crisis of territoriality. The st state still keeps some legitimacy, uh, but it strategizes in order to try and retain uh, sovereignty over these spaces. Right. Well, I think where my argument is going with this is that youth crime prevention emerges in Ireland in this context. And it can't be stripped from it. They're not just there. They came from somewhere. They didn't go out and, uh, you know, uh, they didn't go out and try to you know, re-establish, re as they do in France, every time there's a riot, there's a huge national catharsis about the riot. And they talk about it for weeks, and it's in the public newspapers. So they, they pour over it, and they set up commissions, and, you know, the, the poor, uh, uh, poor, Pictures p appear in the papers the next day of, of a grimacing uh, uh, French uh, Jacques Chirac, you know, after the last Vanu riots that occurred in 2005. They pour over the, these kinds of things in, in, in France. Uh, we didn't really do the same pouring, but things emerge in a political context. That's my point, and it has something to do with the way in which the state uh, penetrates territory. We're half an hour in, or yeah, half, half an hour in? Yeah. I'm not going to dwell on this too much, but uh, there's, been, there's enough kind of literature out there to say that, to, to talk about how uh, uh, the, uh, you know, that the state uh, realizes around this particular time that it can no longer rule through the old uh, division of institutions into hierarchies. It has to do something. It has to decenter itself in some way, build alliances uh, with civil society and the private sector in order to achieve results. You know, we, we, the state's getting too big. We're reaching a, we're reaching a crisis of, of, of government. Uh, we have to do something to make it smaller. Yeah. Uh, so it 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 sets itself up, up into networks. It recruits expertise to help it answer very complex questions because it can't keep all of those officials uh, in the state uh, uh, payroll itself. So it has to recruit alliances. And what this is, what I've done here as a piece of empirical research, is to map out the network of actors who were involved in setting up the original youth diversion programs in those territories. Yeah? My interest from, from this really comes less from the crime prevention side and more from the kind of socio-political kind of analysis side. Yeah? So I'm looking at this really as a case study of, uh, of, of governance. And we have very, very these are, these, I have to give them initials to anonymize them, but AS stands for Assistant Secretary. Uh, PO stands for Principal Officer, very senior people in the state hierarchy, yeah? in the policy making machinery. Assistant Commissioner in the Garda Shia Khan. And the community relations section within, within, within the police force. Uh, and this is on the state side. Yeah? Uh, and on the other side, we have these local actors. In this case, I mean, there are other network maps, but in this case, it's a diocesan youth service. Okay? Uh, and what we have here is literally the state, through this very uh, well connected intermediary in the middle here, uh, is involved in a network. Yeah? And what gets exchanged in networks, the arrows mean is this is an exchange of goodwill between, between them. Yeah? Uh, what us sociologists have come to call social capital. That yeah? Yeah? this person here is acting as a structural bridge between the periphery i.e. the housing estates we just looked at, yeah, and the state. Yeah. And so this is an example of networked governments. Yeah. But we've moved out of kind of the bureaucratic kind of way of doing things towards a, a model of network, networked uh, governments. 
let's not oh, mm, yeah let's do go back in there uh, one of the characters in here is a judge okay so you're talking about very very senior people show kind of intermediaries are connected directly with the little people yeah okay uh, and that's the kind of shape in which uh, yeah. you know that theory about kind of um, Six, six. Uh, what is it? Six uh, stages of what is it? Six, six degrees six of separation. Yeah, yeah. So there's, there's kind of two or three degrees of separation here uh, between a very senior judge, uh, very high public profile. Can't name him, but he's in there. Okay, as part of this network of actors, something conjoins this group of people together. Uh, I never actually got to put my finger on it, but they're the day. Okay. So actors connect the state with the urban periphery. That's my point. Uh, to a type of network governance that integrates territory. And they favor a particular type of practice. They want to see particular things done. They set the agenda for. Uh, you know, who does what in relation to uh, policing, community policing, uh, the building of police stations, uh, the securitization of, of police stations with, uh, with uh, security barriers and lights and CCTV. Uh, this group of people for a short period of time are actually governing parts of, of, of Ireland. Yeah? Uh, and that they, they see themselves as, and I have this documented in interviews, they see themselves as, what they say, taking a global role, taking a coordinating role over all other government departments. Uh, for a period of time, uh, they see themselves as, it was quipped at a conference where, uh, that I attended with the, uh, where the, 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 one of the main speakers was the Secretary of the Department of Justice, who said, uh, we set up a mini cabinet we set up a mini cabinet and I installed myself as Taoiseach. So let me say some, a couple of things about uh, uh, governance of the subject and practice uh, in the few minutes that I have left. Now what Bourdieu argues is that uh, uh, Bourdieu argues is that the, the mode of implication, the way in which we create a kind of a, a common symbolic universe, uh, is he argues through uh, largely through curriculum uh, and through pedagogic relations, uh, mostly in schools, but not only in schools. We do it through art, we do it through media, we do it through sport. Um, I argue that we're doing it in other ways as well, like through youth crime prevention. Yeah. We haven't got time to read this out. But what this, what this, uh, what my interpretation of what this practitioner is saying. Uh, now there are alternative practices. I don't want to say that this is the only interpretation of what the role of a youth crime worker is. Uh, there are alternatives, but they're subordinated. This is the, this is the one that dominates the field. This kind of ideas here. Uh, uh, of you know, presenting the world in this kind of simple kind of binary logic. Yeah. Uh, you know, you've got two choices here. You can go down the road of stealing cars, or you know, uh, the end. The end of that road is prison. The end of that road is prison. Yeah. Uh, or you can be like you know, in a few years' time, you can be chatting to me saying. Well, look, I have all this nice clover, I have all this nice gear, I have a girlfriend, I'm getting married. All the kind of trappings, as it were, of good boys, what I wish, yeah. Um, I've, I've complied, yeah, I've complied. So you get this kind of deviance conformity going on here. There's a, there's a binary logic to all language, uh, uh, according to uh, according to Bourdieu and the people who influenced him from the French uh, uh, Structural Linguistics School. You get this kind of binary logic. 
And Bourdieu calls it a kind of sim symbolic violence. Yeah, that we put frames on things, as Goffman would call it, would say. Yeah? We put frames on things for people. What Bourdieu argues is that we, we place it into this kind of binary logic, yeah? You know, dirty clean, yeah. The area is dirty. We have to, you know, we have to appear to be clean. Uh, you know, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a scarcity of, of, of sanitation. Yeah, it looks like the pre-modern. Yeah, let's clean it up. Uh, straight, narrow, deviance, uh, deviance compliance. I know I probably only have about two minutes left. I suppose what my research has, has been trying to do in the, in the last kind of well, years, I can't remember how many years, and I don't really want to say, it's too long, uh, is to look at the flows of capital, look at the flow of the social and cultural capital between, is it between the young people and the practitioner, the young people and the institutions, or is it between the institutions and the institutions, or is it a little bit more complex than that? Um, and basically, I think what I can say in summary is that there's two types. Yeah? The dominant type tends to be non-conversational. It tends to be very much that kind of thing of it's didactic, it's monologic, it's you're going down the wrong road, you're going to be in prison. Yeah? Uh, and this, this dominates the field. This is the ideas that dominate the field. This becomes the model of good practice. This is what we want. We're, we're the people paying for this. We're the guards, we're the Department of Justice. This is what we want. Don't talk about all this, you know, Paolo who? Paolo Freire? Who got started out? Yeah, you don't want to be introducing anything critical here. We're critical, you know. Uh, we're, our job is social control. You know, we need to keep the place in order. And people want us and we thank us uh, for doing so. So when you look at the capital flows, uh, in these three cases here, in Ballynew, Emmettstown, Fairway, two of them are in Dublin, one of them is in a regional city. Um, the, 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 the capital flow is largely between uh, the state and the institutions. Yeah? Uh, in Emmettstown, for instance, it's between the troika of the police the school principal and the parish priest. Yeah. The ruling the ruling trinity as it were, or a ruling trinity of them. The superintendent, the sergeant, the principal, and the parish priest. Yeah. Uh, and this operates as a kind of flow of capital between people, yeah, a kind of a gift relationship going on here. Uh, really don't have time to get into that, but when the article comes out we probably will have time to read it. Uh, and then you have the subordinate one. Uh, which in a way was probably doing what the Department of Justice might have wanted to get uh, done, which was to work with actual offenders. They wanted to work with actual, we want to get guys who are actually doing stuff, yeah? We don't want to just go out and work with any kid and tell them they need to stay in a straight and narrow. We're already doing that as part of our primary prevention activities anyway. Uh, we want to work with we want to work with uh, the people who really need it. They're not getting a service. These are the most excluded people and are the most the biggest offenders. Nah, we don't want you to do that. We don't want you to do that. We want you to go out and tell everybody how good the guards are. And we want to bring the guards along and get their photographs taken with children. Yeah? Yeah? Getting prizes from guards. Yeah? Getting medals from guards. I went along and played a football match in Finglas with a group of, of young guys. And I got a medal, right? But we lost. We actually lost the match. Hang on, I was, the last time I checked, I was a sociologist, so I think it's my job to kind of actually work that one out a little bit. Why would I get a job? Why would I get a I'm having a Zizek moment here. Why would, I get, why would you give a medal to a loser? Or to maybe then to reinforce their position as a loser? You gave them a prize. <laughs> I have the picture of it in my PhD uh, thesis, a picture of the medal, and hopefully it'll come out in the book. Um, now this model, this model was developed in a, it's a much more conversational style, yeah? much more conversational style of practice. Uh, the, flow of, the flow of capital uh, is between the different actors, but it's also, uh, it's also between the young people and the institutions as well. It's very much a conversational model. Yeah? 
and the, the police and the Department of Justice find this very, very disconcerting. What's this about? We, we can't put a name on this. This is not really what we want to have going on here. Yeah. Uh, uh, we can't define it. We'll call this special. We'll call this a special case because it's not really the template that we want to work from. Yeah. But the workers there do lots of good things. They do lots of good things. They, they, they go out and they work with kids in the street who are doing fishing, you know, uh, in a local pond. And so the guys, the youth worker sets up a lot of networks with these young people, yeah? Networks can do good things, yeah? Um, it isn't all about kind of, it isn't all about governance of the soul and all that kind of stuff. There's actually really good stuff going on here because the guy has got the, the social capital flowing in the right way between the, the, the young people and the and himself, yeah? And he engages in these really kind of elaborate conversations about deep moral uh, dilemmas and deep ethical dilemmas, yeah? Uh, while they're doing the fishing. So you get this conversational style curriculum, this conversational style pedagogy, I should say, uh, going on. So it isn't all, it isn't all doom and gloom, yeah? There are things that people can do to strategize, uh, to make a difference. And so practice, practice counts, yeah? Practice counts what people do matters because the state relies on practitioners and the goodwill of practitioners to implement their commands. The state is dependent, actually, upon practitioners to have their commands implemented. And so what practitioners do to shape how that's implemented really is the issue that we need to focus on going ahead into the future. <laughs>